this is the first Canadian screening of, of this film, Changing the World, One Wall at a Time, which is a documentary feature film produced by, uh, by the filmmaker Mazia Mahari. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Cameron. Uh, I serve as director of the Office of Public Affairs for the Baha'i Community of Canada, and we're really delighted to co-sponsor this event tonight with, um, with Education is Not a Crime, uh, an NGO that Mazia experienced. Uh, Mazia will be joining us a bit later after the film, uh, to do uh, a Q&A session about the process of making the film and how it fits within human rights campaigning uh, for, for the people of Iran. The film we're about to see is about the world's largest street art and human rights campaign. As you'll see in the film, the campaigns uh, included the painting of 41-year-olds in cities around the world, including Atlanta, Cape Town, Delhi, London, Nashville, Sao Paulo, Sydney, in 2000 uh, areas of New York City. The murals all share a common theme. They aim to raise awareness about the denial of higher education to the Baha'is in Iran. This is a campaign started by Mazir Bahari, himself an Iranian Canadian uh, who's not a Baha'i. Uh, but many, will, many of you will know him as a journalist and documentary filmmaker who was jailed in Tehran for about four months in 2009 while he was reporting for Newsweek on demonstrations that followed uh, the re-election of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad as Iran's president. Maziar's Jalen, and the book, the book he wrote subsequent to that, became the basis for John Stewart's 2014 film, Rosewater. So it's actually fitting that we're screening this film today, one day after May 3rd, which is World Press Freedom Day. In many ways, Maziar's life and work is a testament to the importance of press freedom, and to the work of journalists who risk so much to uncover and communicate the truth to their audiences. One thing Mazar said about the film is that he said, Changing the world one wall at a time is the story of an ambitious campaign. We fought brutality with arts and creativity. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for joining us this evening and enjoy the film. We are very fortunate to have Mazar with us tonight and uh very excited to be able to ask you some questions. Uh, and towards the end, we'll open it up and, and give you all an opportunity to ask your questions as well. So, so get those formulated. So maybe I'll start with the personal and then go to the film and talk about some of the themes of the film. And my first question was, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how it came to be that you came across the topic of the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran and why that interested you? Well, uh, thank you so much, everyone, again, for coming. Uh, well, I was always interested in persecuted minorities because I'm coming from a political family, and I'm coming from a political family, and we've always been aware of you know, injustice in Iran and other parts of the world. But the persecution of the Baha'is was something that uh, we were aware of. But at the same time, it was not something that was a priority for us, uh, non-Baha'is. And I think it, most of non-Baha'is in Iran in the 1980s and even in the 1990s can went through the same thing, that we didn't think of Baha'is as the priority, the persecution of the Baha'is as the priority. So when I went back to Iran after 12, 13 years of being outside of Iran in 1997, and I started to work as a journalist and filmmaker, I wanted to continue to work. And I wanted to work, work somehow within the framework of the government. And as a result, I again, even though I was aware of the persecution of the Baha'is, it was a subject that I did not talk about. Because I know if I wrote an article about the Baha'is or a film about the Baha'is, that would be the last article or film that uh, we would do each one. So as a result, uh, it was something that I always wanted to do. So after 2009, and I went through the imprisonment and I came out and I had the sentence in absentia, I knew that I could not go back for what we want. So I started to do whatever I could not do. The uh, film to light the candle, which I made about four years ago, was the first one, and that film uh, 
I think a uh, question there in me, of course, the subject, but also among many other people around the world, and I'm not sure how many people have seen that film. I think a lot of people saw that film uh, uh, in different parts of the world. And because of the success of that film, and because we realized that this is not something, uh, it's just not another film that I've made, we thought it, it would be good to have a campaign around it. So we showed the film in almost 300 cities around the world and in 2015. And then... Uh, For people who don't know, to light a candle was a film that was on the topic of the BIHE, exactly. the Baha'i Institute of Higher Education, uh, and had the story, shared many of the stories of the individuals who that were part of it, or who were teachers, professors around the world, that were teaching, you know, through Skype to the behind scenes. You know. Exactly, and then we thought, you know, how can we uh, do something different, not only a film, do something else that can grab attention of people in different places, and something that can communicate with younger people, especially people who are not aware of Iran or the situation of the Baha'is in Iran and we thought a combination of analog uh, paintings, murals and digital videos could be a new way of communicating with people and telling the story of the Baha'is. So on that... So I guess I answered a few of your questions. Yes, actually. On that, um, on the use of you know, murals and uh, and street art, um, in the film you say that you're fighting brutality with creativity and with art and maybe the writer in me would say you're fighting brutality with beauty and um, you talked a bit about how that idea came into play. Do you think that art is an underutilized resource or method for fighting injustice and raising awareness? I think uh Sadly, whenever people are talking about, whenever governments think about saving money and austerity, whenever families, they want to cut down on uh, their expenses, art and culture are the first victims. Uh, but I think uh, family without uh, art, without books, without paintings, without music, a country without films, books, arts, uh, is a country, is a country, a family without a family or without a real identity. And I think uh, what we have uh, tried to do in the campaign is to fight and resist uh, brutality with art and uh, creativity, but also we thought it would be good to give. Uh, to be the voice of the oppressed, uh, the voice of the uh, survivors of this brutality through art and to portray their identity portray them through art and culture. Okay. Um, on that note about the, the, you know, the brutality and the, the topic that you're talking about, um, it's a very heavy topic, but the film can be difficult to watch. And particularly for me, because in the beginning when you talk about the violent persecution against the Baha'is in Iran, one of the first photos that you show is of my uncle. And it's after he's been tortured and executed, and his body is strewn on the ground so disrespectfully in a pile with six other members of the local Baha'i assembly that he served with in Hamadan, in Hamadan, Iran. And so it's such a heavy topic and a serious one. But despite that, at the end of the film, one I think is left inspired and hopeful and feeling more positive than negative. Why was it important for you that the film carry that tenor? I think the tenor of the film comes from the Baha'i uh, one of the things I always say about working with Baha'is is that it's very difficult to make a dramatic film with Baha'is <laughs> because they're so hopeful and so in a sense uh, non-dramatic about their uh, tragedies. So uh, I mean, I've made films about the Holocaust, I've just made a film about Syria and you know when you ask uh, Jews or Arabs or Italians 
uh, but their tragedies, you know, they go through hysterics and they, you know, cry and they're, they're really emotional. With the Baha'is, we had a very difficult time, so I would ask them why. Okay, so they arrested your father, they tortured your sister, they executed your uncle. How did you feel at that moment? Uh, the person would say, well, in the context of history and the people who follow the faith, I just want your story to <laughs> I think, but I think that's a very, I mean, it's not very good for film, but it's very good for that. And I think uh, I chose uh, BIG because I thought that uh, it was not only the story of victims and tragedies, it was the story of resilience, constructive resilience. It was the story of resistance, peaceful, nonviolent resistance. And I think the film is just a reflection of. Uh, the Baha'i community and what they went through and what they're going through. Thank you for those kind words. And also, thank you. For, I don't know. I'm not trying, but uh, for leading so well into my next question, I feel like every question flows into the other because my next question is about this um, cycle of you know crisis and victory. You tell the story in the film of one of the murals that actually had to be painted over because of opposition in the local community, but then how that led to national and international coverage of the campaign and brought so much more awareness than if that hadn't happened. And when I saw that clip in the film, it made me think of this idea that progress can be achieved or is achieved through the cycle of crisis and victory, of adversity being followed by success. Um, when you reflect on your own life, or you reflect on the state of the world, how do you think that concept applies? I think uh, that vandalism is kind of symbolic of uh, what many ignorant people in Iran are treating the Baha'i faith, the followers of the Baha'i faith, and other uh, people as well but especially the high pace. In a sense, I always say that the best promoter of the Baha'i faith in Iran is the Iranian government. <laughs> because if uh, they just let the Baha'is lead their lives, and, you know, tolerate them, and recognize their lives as, you know, them as the, you know, as citizens of the country, I don't think that many people around the world would know about the Baha'is. Because, you know, what was their lives? It was like the same as like, before the revolution in the Shah's time. You know, not many people knew what the Baha'is were. So, uh, after the revolution, with constant propaganda against the Baha'is, but at the same time brutalizing the rest of the society, I think the Iranian government somehow created this sympathy for the Baha'is among the other parts of the society. And in a sense, uh, all the insults and all the negative attributions that the Iranian government uh, makes about the Baha'is, they're kind of attracted for ordinary Iranians. That you know, the Baha'is, they believe in equality of men and women, and universal education, and also things that the Baha'is don't believe in. You know, like they say the Baha'is love to drink and love to have orgies and stuff. So, the ordinary young Iranian would say, well, if they believe in equality and they love Ortiz, what's wrong with them? <laughs> I, actually, it, it reminds me of uh, someone once told me that you know you succeeded when you're criticized. You know that um, when you attract opposition, when someone attacks you, it means that you struck hard enough that you you know, struck a chord that your, your message has had so much power that someone has now spoken up against you. Exactly, and especially uh, if you are criticized by someone who represents so much evil and so many wrong things in the Iranian society. So people, when they look at many of these conservative clerics, revolutionary guards, who lead a very, very wrong life are preaching a very wrong religion, an interpretation of religion. 
they just know that uh, you know whatever they are proposing must have some sort of merit. Did your experiences in Iran? Um, you know, what you went through with being in solitary confinement for four months and uh, while your wife was pregnant with your child, um, and then having that followed by, again, raising awareness on an international level about the situation of human rights, about the situation of journalists. Um, do you feel that uh, that process of crisis and victory you know, can apply to all of our lives in some ways? Well, uh in the context of what other people, but I'm serious, like in the context of what other people have gone through in Iran, what my experience is uh, not worthy of talking about. But the only difference between me and many of my colleagues and friends in Iran who are in prison is that the people outside of Iran knew my name. And you know how to pronounce my name to a certain extent, and they know my story, and my colleagues in the media did such an amazing job uh, having the campaign for me. And I think uh, that is the reason that I feel some sort of duty to uh, be the voice of many people who are not as well known outside of Iran as I was when I was incarcerated. And on that note of your colleagues in the media and yourself, uh, you know, as in your professional life as a journalist, um, yesterday, as uh, Jeff mentioned, was World Press Freedom Day. What do you think that, that press freedom and journalistic freedom means at a time like the age we're living in of so much change, when the media is under attack in so many parts of the world? Um, when anyone with a smartphone can transmit information instantly and globally, what uh, what comes to mind to you this year as you think about press freedom? Uh, well, I think uh, when it's at the advent of social media, uh, at the beginning when you know Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, you know they were becoming popular, we had high hopes that they are going to help us to. Uh, talk about the truth and spread the truth, but in a sense, they became uh, a force for you know not only fake news but also uh, total falsehood in many sense. And they not only, I mean, in many sense, they uh, united people uh, in certain instances, like in Iran in 2009, like in Brazil, or in uh, in Thailand, in Ukraine, different, there are positive uh, instances, but overall, especially in the last two years, manipulation of social media, we see that how evil it can be, and how dividing and how divisive as a tool it can be. So you think um, making a traditional, or not so much traditional, but the Institution, institutional media that provides so much um, uh, a foundation for verification, for um, you know, cost checking, for you know, we're talking about you know, journalists being embedded in different situations. Uh, that that is an important part of. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is not the subject of tonight, but I can go on uh, for hours about this. One of the uh, main negative effects of social media is that it's made uh, journalism somehow freely available to people. So in a sense, people don't uh, respect the value of professional journalism. And they want uh, information fast, and they want uh, to be gratified by information uh, quickly. And as a result, uh, journalistic institutions like local newspapers, many uh, different bureaus of different broadcasters and news media outlets around the world, they are shutting down. They, uh, many uh, news uh, media outlets, they cannot afford having journalists. They cannot afford it time-wise because people, they want uh, instant gratification. 
because if New York Times take uh, a day to verify a story, at the end of that day, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, whatever, they have had millions of uh, stories about, I don't know, uh, Cohen or Stormy Daniels or whatever. So I think uh, it's made uh, professional journalism and fact-checking less valuable. And I think that is the biggest disservice of social media for professional journalism. And also, I think the fact that Facebook and Twitter and other uh, social media, they're not sharing their profit from uh, news with those news uh, media outlets. That has managed uh, social media, news media outlets as well. There are so many negative uh, consequences of uh, the social media and spread of social media. Okay, well, I think I'll uh, open it up to the audience to take a few more questions before we close. So if anyone has a question, there's two microphones, actually. Uh, please approach the microphones. And um, while you're getting your questions ready, let me ask everyone to pose a question, i.e. with a question mark at the end, as much as we like to share our comments and stories and congratulations for Maziar. Uh, let's use the opportunity to, to ask some questions. So uh, go ahead, sir. Yeah, I was just curious, does the average man on the street know what's happening to the Bahamas, or do they try and cover it up? Or? In Iran? Yeah. In Iran, yes, I think uh, most people, at least most people who follow the news, they know about the Baha'is because of propaganda against the Baha'is. So the propaganda is so widespread, and I think Jeff can tell us more about the propaganda against the Baha'is that especially in recent years, there have been more propaganda against the Baha'i. So people, whether they want it or not, they hear about the Baha'i and propaganda against um, I won't go on too long, but I did want to say thank you so much for your incredibly empowering and uplifting work. Um, I think as a member of the Baha'i community, we often think of the Baha'is in Iran as our brothers and sisters, and feel maybe powerless or confused about how, how it is that we can assist them other than prayer. So it's, it's um, yeah, very, very empowering. And, yeah, and one of the things that I found really inspiring is the way in which artists were engaged in the work. Um, and I was just curious to hear a little bit more about the aspect in the film that's really beautifully illustrated of process and how the community owns those murals. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more if there's any other stories of how that's kind of being followed and, and also the plans for the, the film to be kind of shared and how, you know, what's, what's kind of to come in terms of sustainability is such a great project. Yeah, so I think what we have realized is that the mural itself and the fact that someone puts uh, paintings and work of art on the wall is just the beginning of the conversation. And then the conversation continues with videos, and then you know the mural is there. And also when we have workshops with the people in the community, and especially when you go to communities like Harlem or Brixton in London, or we are uh, producing a series of murals in Detroit now. I think when communities they think that. They own the uh, campaign, it's much more effective. So, at the moment, uh, we're going to do a series of murals in Africa, in seven countries in Africa. But also, we are we have uh, started a big campaign in Detroit as well, and hopefully, it's not. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for your question. Uh, the question is, um, since your first film is distributed and viewed it's been four years, and now I don't know how many people know about this project, have you had uh, any reactions from the government of Iran or the people of Iran based on this? And you know, how many in Iran are they being threatened? Is it doing it? Maybe you don't have to know. But how about the first question? Have any reactions from the government? 
So uh, my family is threatened regardless of what I do with the bomb or not, so that's the uh, subject. Yeah. My family is uh, threatened regardless of my work with the Baha'i. So, uh, yes, the film has been seen by many, many people, thousands or maybe millions of people in Iran. And unfortunately, the same way that PIHD and being a student or a teacher at PIHD is a crime, owning the film is a crime as well. And someone, maybe you know his name, Omid Ali Shanaz, who was a children's rights activist, uh, he was imprisoned, and one of his charges was having a copy of To Light the Ten, unfortunately. So, but again, it shows that the film was effective in terms of showing the reality of Iran. So yes, that film has been downloaded thousands of times and people have seen it. And you know, we're getting feedback uh, regularly. And this film will be soon shown on one of the main uh, satellite channels. Uh, I cannot tell you which one, because it's very negotiating to two. So one of them will show version version of this conversation. Any other? No, no, no. Satellite channels are all the same. Okay, that's it. Our last question, sir. Okay. Thanks for your work. Um, very inspiring. Um, of course, as you go forward with the, with the type of work that you do, there's no doubt that there's going to be more opposition. What is it that fuels you forward despite this opposition that happens? And also, can you talk to us about some of the um, future ideas that you might have? So obviously the last question is the most difficult part. <laughs> uh, well, I think when you... Uh, I don't know, I mean, it's something that... Uh, you know, when I was in prison, the uh, interrogator was always saying that you have a bug in you, that you know, you have a journalist uh, bug and I'm going to debug you by the time you get out of prison. But in fact, I think uh, when you go through that kind of experience, and even if you don't go through that kind of experience, if you have certain consciousness about uh, these subjects, you're passionate and that passion drives you to do things. And I think I'm very blessed that I can help others to produce these things and I can produce my own films, etc. So I think that is, and also it's a job, you know, for me it's the way that I make my living and, you know, this is the way that it's, it's what I do. And what was the other question? Oh yeah, the future projects. So future projects is to have more murals. Uh, different. In this campaign, uh, for now we have more murals more screenings of this film, and then uh, eventually do uh, a combination of film and murals in other places. So I think uh, what we realize whenever we show the film in different places, it's uh, people ask us like what uh, you have asked that how can we participate. So, <coughs> One of our colleagues, Salim, who you see in the film, uh, he's, he's going to Africa on Tuesday. He's going to seven different countries in order to show the film and talk about the film and hopefully have murals in seven different countries. And the Baha'is in those uh, countries are quite supportive as well. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>
Canada. He's testifying before Parliament on Wednesday or Thursday. Can we do a can we do a screening of the film sometime in a week from now? And um, fortunately, we're able to do that thanks to the help of a good number of people. Some of whom I, I can recognize right now. First of all, Absu Bishanari, who is a gifted storyteller and a refugee lawyer in his spare time, um, really uh, helped us to uh, to navigate last year's so Thank you. Very much. This would be possible without Cedric Albert, who I don't know if she's here or not. She's right there. She's right there. <laughs> Cedric, who organized a lot of things very quietly, patiently behind the scenes. Thank you, Cedric. I'm uh, sure Liz Chapel, the manager of the, the Toronto High Center. Along with many volunteers who are here and who you can't see, I'll meet uh, Giammi, who I was pressed into service by Cedric very cheerfully to help us with the audiovisual tonight. And Dave, the cameraman at the back, who is asked perhaps today. <laughs> so, with that, good night. Uh, have a safe trip home, and, um, and I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.